Jane, you've spent most of your life in the classroom teaching. Would you have enjoyed teaching the young Jane? Oh, I don't think so. <laughs> really? No, I think I was probably um, a supercilious little so-and-so in some respects. Oh, really? Yeah, I, I, I didn't, um, particularly in the junior school, I found uh, a lot of my classmates annoying because they were um, silly, you know. They weren't really, really uh, into um, English or music or something like that as much as I was. And sometimes I used to wish they'd just sort of shut up and go away. <laughs> <laughs> but after Year 10 it was different. It was very different because the teachers, back in those days, you know, kids left in Year 10 um, if they weren't university interested. And the teachers seemed to treat us differently, like human beings. And so I enjoyed Year 11 and 12. So, so much going more. back further, yeah. where did music, where, how did music start for you? I think there's always been music in my family. Not that my parents were professional musicians at all, but they were both um, music lovers in, in different ways. So starting with Dad, he, Mum used to complain that he was uh, tone deaf, couldn't sing a tune, couldn't dance, blah, blah, blah. And yet you, you'd hear on the radio three bars of a piece and he'd say, oh, that's Mahler's Third Symphony. Or, you know, he could recognise these things. So he was a great listener of classical music. I think that's through his father. He had a great uh, record collection. Remember, right. you know, LPs? Oh, <laughs> yes. And I actually inherited the gramophone, the big, you know, beautiful carved solid wood yes. piece of furniture to play them on um, and so he was very interested in music from that point of view but never a performer uh, my mother and was it all classical music that he listened to or was it yes, yes. all classical like pop music wasn't didn't exist mm -hmm. right? Uh, and I can remember growing up in Armadale, there were two radio stations. One was the ABC and one was the local 2AD that only played pop songs. Well, that was never allowed on in our house. <laughs> and um, my mother on her side, on, on my grandma's side, my grandmother was a singer and a piano player. She used to play the piano for the silent movies in Newcastle at the um, Boolaroo Cinema, I think. And we have photos of her as Iolanthe which would have been around about 1916 or 18 or maybe just after the First World War, anyway. So she was very musical. But I remember um, both she and my mother insisting that I have music lessons and my brother have music lessons from a non-family member, somebody outside, because Grandma had tried to teach Mum the piano and she just wasn't interested. And she, you know, as... It's very hard to teach your own children. Absolutely. So, so yeah. your mother's interested in music? Uh, she uh, was interested in music, more light classical. Um, I can remember she could... Uh, my grandmother had a massive cupboard of sheet music, you know, from the uh, early 20th century and, and a bit later. And I learned... I used to... I used to play the piano at her place. I'd never practice my A and B pieces. I'd just sight read my way through the cupboard because it was full of stuff like Sigmund Romberg and, uh, you know, all those old musicals and... Uh, things like that. That was fantastic. And Mum sort of was brought up with liking that sort of style of music because I can remember we were listening to some jazz once on the radio in the car and she said, oh, I don't like jazz. They really know how to spoil a good tune. <laughs> <laughs> so that was the, that was it. But, but we were always going to concerts and luckily the um, SSO came up to Armadale once a year and we had eight what were called ABC concerts back then. And And I also had a terrific set of music teachers so... Uh, yeah, so I think music's always been in the family. My brother's a flautist. Well, he was, he's a doctor now, but he grew up playing the flute. And because Armadale had such a vibrant musical community... And still does. Yes. And still does. And yes. I think it's because of the university there and the teachers' college back then. Uh, a lot of our teachers at, at Armadale High School were fantastic because they were the wives, husbands of um, people employed at the university. So that was sort of a, a pool of really amazing talent. I think also it was... There is a tradition there, isn't there? And it's what what's expected, you know, things like the Armadale Step that still, yeah, still yeah, continues. Really. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, I, well, I was very lucky in a way in that I did all my schooling in Armadale. I wasn't born in Armadale, but I moved there just when I started primary school, kindergarten. And so I went to Armadale Demonstration School, it was called then, and they had a really good choir. I've just come in contact, again, with the woman who used to take that, this teacher, Yvonne McLeod, who sings in... Uh, a choir here in Sydney now and she's in her 80s and still singing and yeah you know, so we had that influence and then when I went to high school 
I didn't do elective music at school because that, this was the arrogant me thinking that, oh, I get enough music at, you know, Sinertialist Convent doing theory with the nuns and I have my piano uh, lessons and I had my flute lessons when I was in primary school and that would be enough, thank you very much. But then I realised by about year, year 10 that I really, really liked music yes. and so I decided to pick it up as an elective in year 11 and that was when my piano teacher, Wendy Huddleston, decided to go back to classroom teaching. So she was my teacher. So I had her, uh, she was a good friend of Richard Gill's. I think they went through the con together. Brilliant sight reader, real depth of knowledge about music. And then at Duval High School, there was Deirdre Rickards as well, who's still a live wire up in Armadale. Absolutely. Yeah, with the music community. So I had some excellent teachers, plus some... Um, Robin Driscoll, who was a, who's become the piano teacher in Armadale, the go-to piano teacher, she, she was so good. We were very, very lucky. And then we had the lecturers at the Teachers College who would run the youth orchestra and things like that. So, yeah, there was a lot of music. Can I just backtrack yeah. when you mentioned that, that you learned from the nuns at the convent, which was very much part of a you know, culture and country. In a country town, in wasn't country it? Town. Well, sometimes I think the people were lucky and sometimes the nuns seemed to take out their frustrations. On the we students. were very lucky yes. um, because we had a lovely, two lovely nuns. There were Mother Cecilia and Mother Augustine, or I believe technically they're Sister Cecilia and Sister Augustine. Now, Gussie was good friends with Daniel Herskovit, so I met him when I was a kid and wrote to it and they used to do, give concerts up there. Um, and then Mother Cecilia used to play violin in the Armadale Orchestra, so when they put on Madame Butterfly, she was, you know, playing the, the violin. That's what got my interest in opera. I was going to be an opera singer after seeing that. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. you, you finished school in uh, Armadale, and what was the next? Well, the next step was I had absolutely no idea what I wanted to do in terms of career. You know how you go through teenage years, oh, oh I really want to be a marine biologist until you actually realise you have to be on a boat, <laughs> which I didn't think was going to be very good. And then I did chemistry in year 11 and thought, no, a career in the sciences is not really for me. But luckily I got a Rotary Scholarship to Germany for a year, so I had a gap year between high school and university. And going to Germany was phenomenal because, I mean, music is so much a part of life there, everywhere. I can remember going to <clears throat> my first host family and... Um, and Marlena said to me, I'm going to a concert tonight. And I said, oh, that's interesting. What is it? And she said, oh, it's this German singer called Annalisa Rottenberger. And I went, what? She's in town? And she couldn't, Marlena couldn't believe that I'd actually heard of it. But I grew up buying opera records, just loved it. So she said, I'll get you, an, I'll get you a ticket. They're doing, oh, she says, I don't know the work. She said, it's called Four Last Songs by Richard Strauss. <laughs> oh, well, I was in seventh heaven. Yes. So, and then I was going to a school there that had a music program and I got to go on tour to, to Spain with the orchestra, even though I didn't play an orchestral instrument in those days, they let me go as the sound recorder. <laughs> so that was phenomenal. Um, just a great experience. So by the time I'd come back to Australia, I thought, yeah, I think I want to do music. And I'd had early admission into UNE anyway. So I knew that that was possible, but I couldn't. I couldn't decide between French and German, which I loved. I'd learnt German in Germany, but I'd learnt French at school. So I thought I'll be a, a language and music teacher. And so luckily we had great lecturers at, at uh, UNE. Uh, I don't know if you ever knew of uh, Gordon Anderson. He had a personal chair in music there. He wasn't the head of department, but he was the world's foremost authority on the medieval motet. And he did it practically all by microfiche, you know, hardly yes. ever actually went overseas. And yet he'd written heaps. But also he was a phenomenal jazz pianist, and he was the one that really got me interested in, in jazz music. So it was a great experience. And also the other thing was that the New England Ensemble, Wendy Lorenz, Andrew Lorenz, um, Yanis Laws and Robert Harris, were in residence as the chamber music. So I, Wendy Lorenz was actually my piano teacher, and she's another con graduate and I learned so much about chamber music turning the pages for her in concerts so it was a real I, I suppose you'd say it's turning a real, the pages is, can be the most terrifying it's job in the whole so world. scary <laughs> it's much easier to play particularly if there's repeats and you don't know exactly how far back it goes and the music falls off the stand <laughs> but no I learned so much about you know, I have a love of Brahms and Schumann and Schubert piano trios thanks to them or piano quartets 
So you finished, <coughs> finished your university course there? And yeah, so as I said earlier, I, I, I really wanted to be an opera singer, so I was having lessons, voice lessons, and then I get to uni and I discover this thing called musicology, which I never knew anything about, but it was just absolutely fascinating, and I just got so involved in um, reading what people had said about music and analysing it and all that sort of stuff that I thought, oh, this is really good too. So I did honours. I, I did German and French, and I did honours in so joint honours in French and music. I was going to do it in medieval music and do, and Gordon was teaching me um, paleography and stuff like that but then very sadly he had a heart attack and died. So that wasn't and there wasn't anybody there actually to take over who was as cluey mm. with his expertise. So I remember the head of department Cecil Hill sat down and said well what's, what's your real passion and I said well I really love opera and he said well why don't you do your honours thesis on opera. And, and then he said, you do French, you're doing well at French, why don't you do something on French opera? I thought, that's a clever idea. So I thought, well, I remember lectures from Graham Jones, the French professor, on a book called uh, L'Histoire du Chevalier des Cueurs et de Manon Lescaut, and I knew that Manon Lescaut had been made into a number of operas, so I did a study, a comparative study, of five of the operas, including one by Hans Werner Henze. That was just fascinating. So that's what I was going to do. I was going to go out into the real world and teach for three years and then come back and do a PhD. Well, I never did go back. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yet. Yes, 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 well. Mm. So you went out into the real world? Yes, I went out into the real world. I was hoping to get a job in the northwest area because, you know, back in those days, I had a scholarship, Commonwealth scholarship or something, and a teacher's scholarship scholarship and they do an interview and they say where would you like to teach and I said oh northwest region first choice north coast region second choice metropolitan third you know last choice and a whole lot of people were getting jobs before me that had applied after me and I'm thinking so Narrabri High I went Corindai High and all this and I thought what's this is really weird so I rang up the staffing and it was I don't know if you've ever heard of Lindsay Aikhead, but any teacher, yes. <laughs> any secondary teacher from the Department of Education would have heard of Lindsay Aikhead. And he said to me, oh, no, I didn't give you this job because, uh, a job because I thought you were taking Deidre Rickard's maternity leave job at Duval High. And I said, well, she asked me, but I said no, because I actually wanted to go out and get a, a full-time permanent job. And then he said, oh, well, you're bloody stupid for not taking it. And I said, what do you mean? And he said, because... You should have taken her job and then if a permanent job had come up in the meantime, I'd have given it to you. And I said, um, you just told me you didn't give me a permanent job because <laughs> it was all a bit of a mess. Anyway, funny, funny about um, contacts. The woman who worked for Lindsay Aiken in the office had been my dad's secretary at Armadale High School because he was deputy principal at Armadale High School. And so there was a connection there. And so she got the ball rolling. The next thing I know, there's a telegram. Gosh. Remember telegrams? <laughs> Telling me that I'd been posted to Riverston High School. And I said to Dad, Riverston High School, where's that? And he said, oh, it's Western Sydney on the way to Windsor. He said, there's a big meatworks there. <laughs> oh, that's great, okay. What about a musical tradition? And there was some part about, well, sheep won't be safely grazing there. <laughs> but that was it. But three years I was there, and, and that was fabulous. Um, the, the principal was very into musicals and expected a, mu a school musical. He and his wife used to be in the Blacktown Musical Society putting on musicals. So I did Oliver and Bye Bye Birdie, first year out teacher. I, no, I refused to do it in my first year. I wanted to get my feet. And there was a, a really fantastically supportive Met West Music Teachers Association that was really, really good. I also got involved in the uh, music camps with Mel Hewitt. Because um, Lindsay Hunt, Leslie, no, what's his name? Hunt? Terence Hunt had started these back um, when I was at high school, but I was never allowed to go because I didn't play an orchestral instrument. And in those days, they didn't take pianists and singers. And I got really interested in choral music by then, and I was doing a lot of trying, beginning a school choir. And so I went along to these um, music camps that Mel had was organising that now would accept piano players and singers. And so there was a big choral um, thrust there as well. That's when I got my first opportunity to conduct an orchestra. It was a bit scary. 
because I'd been conducting the, um, taking the singers through, and we were doing Zadok the priest, and we were going to put it on with all the, uh, the, the forces from the um, camp. And Mel said, I oh, was saying you've done all this work with them, why don't you conduct the orchestra? I thought, oh, okay, that'd be lovely. All I have to do is wave my arms around you. It's just like choral conducting, <laughs> not. Anyway, I, I was a little bit put off, a bit daunted, I think, uh, because he said at the end of it, that's okay, but you're left-handed. You're going to have to learn to conduct with your right hand because they're used to looking at this particular spot here for the downbeat. And I said, well, that's okay, I'll just move over there. And then the <laughs> downbeat will be there. I wish, I really wish I'd had a conversation that I had many, many years later with Simone Young where I asked her, what's your stance on left-handed conductors? And she said, well, look at Donald Runnicles, blah, 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 blah. For heaven's sake, just do it. That's great. I'm that a left-handed conductor. Are you a left-handed yes. conductor too? <laughs> Join the club. But have you ever been um, taken to task for it? Oh, probably. Yeah. I just smile Good. sweetly and ignore. Good. Yes. Good. It's yes. just something I just naturally do. Yeah, well, I stuck to choral conducting after that because I was so interested in yes. choirs and I would always run a choir whatever school I was at, yeah. Mm -hmm. So then after that, um, so this would be 1986, Mel had come to, to see me one night and said, oh, how would you like to work for us in the, in those days it was called the Arts Education Studio. And I said, oh, sounds like fun. So I did for a year, running or helping to run all the music camps and do you remember Empire Day concert? Uh, we had to have a performance for Empire Day. I mean... You... I didn't live in Australia then. Oh, okay. Who yeah. would know what that was these days? Yes. Yeah. Mm. So, yeah, that was fun. And the choral concerts down at the Opera House and the primary recorded concerts, 800 recorders. Mm. Can you imagine that, Mark? 800 mm. recorders. Nearly yeah, yeah, enough. But the good thing about that was they would uh, pay us to go around to the schools in New South Wales, to so the primary schools I remember going to, oh, Cooma High and Bowning and to take the recorders, Gundagai, and they loved it. I mean, the schools just loved having this visitor from Sydney come down and work with the choirs and the recorders, so that was great. I got to see quite a lot of New South Wales doing that. So you spent a year with, with that? With uh, that, yes. yeah. Yes, and then yeah. What, what followed after that? <clears throat> well, then, at that stage, Graham Russell, who was the Inspector of Music, had we'd come in contact with one another through all that AES stuff and he said oh look I because at that stage I wanted to move into the city because I just met my husband-to-be mm. and he was living in Leichhardt and I think I thought living at North Parramatta and blah, blah. Yes. and I'd actually been living in at Leichhardt while I was at AES because AES was at Chippendale, Blackfriars right. yes. and so I mentioned this to Graham Russell and he said oh I think I could probably um, organise something for you so I got this job at Canterbury Girls High School and that was really interesting. The very first day I arrived, the um, principal, Yvonne Carter, embraced me with open arms. Oh, welcome to the Great Academy, um, da 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 da. And, and what subject, what is your subject? And I said, oh, I'm a music teacher. Music teacher? Music? I don't want a music teacher, go away, she said. <laughs> so I had to ring Graham Russell and say, what is going on? Apparently. A music teacher had gone overseas. He wanted this person replaced with a music teacher, but she didn't. <laughs> it's the second time I've heard a similar really? story from John Benson. Yes, really, it's exactly yeah. the same thing happened. To it, well, it? I spent twenty-seven years at Canterbury Girls. <laughs> After that, <laughs> went through about I don't know five principals. Yeah, yeah. So tell me about tell me about that that school. Oh, look, that school was interesting. A girls' school, um, but. And, and not a selective school, of course, so you had an incredible mix of students, not only ability-wise, but also ethnic-wise. We had, I think at one stage, 60 languages spoken at that school by, you know, at home by those kids. And it was always a, a moving population. When I first went there, it was very big Greek and Italian um, kids. And then it gradually changed. I think as the parents... They come into that Canterbury area first and then as they get a little bit more money they move out into other suburbs. Uh, and then a, another group came in so then there were a lot of Korean kids and then a lot of Islander, Pacific Islander kids. And they amazingly musical people, those, those girls. So some of my most rewarding experiences I think at that school were taking kids who had very, very little musical um, opportunities and getting them to sing in a choir and taking them off to the opera house and, and they were just, you know, 
blown out of their minds by all that sort of stuff. And that was great. Any kid who came in who could play the violin or piano or whatever really, really well, I'd just say, would you like to go and audition for the conservatorium? <laughs> and they did, and they would get in. Because yes. you know? I just think you are probably wasted here at this school with your talents. Yes. And, and so, yeah, I've got, I'm still in contact with about three students who came to the Con High. So that's lovely. Yeah. So from that school, you were there for a long time? I well, I was there for a long time, and, and things have got a bit unpleasant there in terms of the executive and things like that. Also, um, it was a little bit frustrating because um, the kids became very, very chatty, talkative, sort of off the planet, not wanting to focus and things like that. So you spent a lot of time just getting them to crowd focus. Control. To, crowd control. And more crowd control, basically, than actual getting them to learn anything. But, I, you know, I was teaching them drums, like I can play three rhythms and I was <laughs> on the drum kit. I'm about four chords beyond them on the guitar. You know? So I do a unit on drums and a unit on guitar and a unit on keyboard and things like that. Or always trying to start with the music that they are familiar with mm -hmm. and then sort of branching out and saying, oh, but what about listening to this or this or jazz or classical music? I did start a jazz band there. Not that I'm a jazz performer myself, but I just had some kids that just needed to do something like that. So that was good. I sort of grappled with transposing instruments, as you do. <laughs> yes. So it's from that school? Oh, so from that school, I actually... It's really funny, because when you... I was in the old super scheme, luckily, and you get the opportunity to tick the, what age do you want to retire at. And for women, they were given the option of um, 55. And I remember my dad saying to me, oh, you, you should tick that box. And I'm saying, but I don't want to retire when I'm 55. It's, you know, he said, just do it just in case, right? So I did. And I was actually very grateful because after things got a little bit um, uh, unpleasant, uh, some people would say toxic, uh, I thought, I can retire. I'm 55. So I saw my HSC kids out to, um, to October and then I took long service leave. And... But all this time I've been doing HSC marking, you see, and that's an amazing experience, really collegial experience, and that's why I always team up every year with Jeff and Ian Barker and all these music teachers from private and public schools. Phenomenal experience. And I remember being at Mark. So I should just explain yeah. that HSC is the final year exams here in New South Wales. That's right, and mm -hmm. it's always marked externally, but marked by actual teachers in that sub teachers or lecturers in that subject area. And um, a lot of people sort of found out that I was retired. And I got all these job offers, like, would you like to do a maternity leave stint at Abbotsley or something at Knox or something? And I thought, well, that's a long way from Asheville. Do I really <laughs> want to be doing that? I thought, well, I'll just sort of wait it out and see. Then I had a phone call from Ian Barker and he'd say, how about you come and work with us at the Con High for a year? Just a year, he said. And I said, oh, well, you know... Okay, maybe. I said, I'm a bit over year seven and eight because I just had four year seven classes in one year and four year eight classes in the same year. Can you imagine writing reports on these kids yes. that you see once a week if you're That's lucky? Right. Yeah. And he said, oh, no, 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 we don't want you for seven and eight. Just, just, just seniors, just HSC. That's, we want your HSC experience. And I said, I can't really say no, can I? <laughs> <laughs> so I came and that was a year. And, and this is my 10th year. So... Something must be working. <laughs> it's a great place. That's great. Mm. That's great. It is a very special school, isn't it? How, oh, it how, is. how, how would you how would you summarise the sort of mix of students at the Conservatory? High well, school? it's interesting because I did a, a master of music through New South Wales Uni, and part of it was educational uh, psychology and stuff with Gary McPherson, and I was working with him on a longitudinal study that he was doing on why some kids. Persist with music, and why kids some drop, why some drop out, and I actually did my paper on kids who had been already targeted as as music students, and why they wanted to keep on doing it. And I thought, what better group to interview than Year Ten at the Con High? And so Barbara McRae was very happy for me to, to come and do that. And I remember asking them, so what do you like best about being at the Con High? And this girl said to me. Um, you know, at my at my last school, 
I was just a, a nerd, like a music nerd. And now I'm at the con, we're all nerds together. <laughs> and they just love the fact that they're like-minded. And that's what I like. But as a teacher, there's a lot of differences, I have to admit. A lot of differences between um, students' um, passion or lack thereof. <laughs> yes. Yeah. It's difficult, isn't it? Because uh, <coughs> students have to practice a lot to get up to a really high standard. That's true. And parents are aware of that. And then this actually can kill off the passion, can't it? Absolutely. And that's yes. a major problem. It has to be an intrinsic motivation. And it's interesting when you compare the students at the Con High that have come in from Year 7 and then the ones that have come in at Year 10, Year 11, and the attitude. Like, I think a lot of the kids that have come in from Year 7 know of no other, have no other secondary school experience. They don't know what it's like. And they are not always aware of the amazing privileges that, and opportunities that they have here, like accompanists, you know, top-notch um, piano accompanists. And they don't have to put up with what my kids at Canberra did, their classroom teacher playing the piano for yes. them at every exam. Uh, and I don't think they're aware. And I can remember one girl who came in from another school in year 11 and she just got stuck into the cohort and said, you don't know how lucky you are, you've got this, you've got this, you this. so just shut up and stop your whinging. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, that's exactly right. Yes, yeah, yes. That's exactly right. Well, Jane, thanks for sharing your fascinating story. That's okay. Thank you very much for having me.